Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you joined us today. We've heard and even repeated catchy band-aid phrases that seem comforting and empowering. Phrases like, God helps those who help themselves. Speak your truth. Follow your heart. But did you know the Bible doesn't say any of that? In this study, we'll turn to Scripture to expose commonly repeated misconceptions and find freedom and true power in the life-changing truth of God's Word. Hey, would you turn in your Bibles, would you turn that dial to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 in the New Testament. Good morning, welcome to church. So happy to see all of your faces here today. Uh, We are continuing in this series, The Bible Doesn't Say That. We're unpacking certain phrases, sayings, ideas that people have long thought the Bible says when it actually says something different. And uh, this is one of them, money is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy chapter 6. So there was a guy who was very successful, made a lot of money, doing really well, not too happy, went to a pastor and he said, you know, Pastor, when I had $50,000, I was a happy man. Now I have about $500,000, and I'm miserable. Pastor said, that's an easy fix. Just give away $450,000. Well, the man looked at him and said, well, you know, it's not that simple. He said, having money is like holding on to an electrical wire. The more the juice, the tighter the hold. Now, I don't know how much juice is in your wire, how much money is in your bank account. It's none of my business. But I want to talk about this saying, money is the root of all evil. When it comes to the subject of money, it's impossible to avoid it for one very simple reason. You are alive. If you breathe air, if you live on this planet anywhere, you have to deal somehow with money. And it's been the case for about 4,000 years since coins were first developed and used in the kingdom of Lydia, which is modern-day Turkey. That's where they believe it all started when people started giving little pieces of round, spherical disks of silver coins for work or for goods and services. Everyone has some relationship to money, even if it's a passing relationship. You know, there was a guy who said, you know, they tell me money talks, but if money talks, the only thing it's ever said to me is, bye. (laughs) But you have some form of a relationship with money. And we turn to the Bible, as always, because the Bible has a lot to say about money. A lot to say about money. Has a lot to say about earning money, spending money, saving, giving, investing, and even wasting money. To give you a little perspective, in Scripture, there are about 500 verses on prayer. There's another 500 verses or thereabouts, a little bit less, on the subject of faith. There are 1,500 verses on the second coming of Christ, but the Bible has over 2,300 verses that discuss our relationship to money or wealth or possessions. When you look to the New Testament alone, Jesus... Just his teaching, just look at the red words, 15% of all of Jesus' preaching in the Gospels was on this subject. 11 of the 39 parables that we have deal with the subject of money. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three Gospels, the synoptics, it is estimated that one out of every six verses is about this subject. And the only subject Jesus taught on more about than money was on the kingdom of God. That was his number one subject. We also know from Scripture that money can become a problem. And there are examples of people that had a relationship with money and it just went south. 
One such person was a guy by the name of Achan. Any of you guys remember Achan from Joshua chapter 6 and 7? Achan was the guy who, after they took over Jericho, lusted after a new suit of clothes, a Babylonian garment. He hid the garment and gold and silver for himself. And they found out about it because they lost the next battle because of this guy's problem with money. And so they took him out and uh, they stoned him to death. (laughs) Uh, Yes, the Bible says that. And um, then he was really (laughs) Achan. Then there is Solomon in the Bible that had enormous amounts of wealth. But after having all of that wealth, he looked at it and he used a word to sum up his life. Remember what that word was? Vanity. Vanity. Emptiness. Soap bubbles, you might say. There's just nothing there, no substance. Vanity of vanities, it did not satisfy him. In the New Testament, there's a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. They pretended to be very generous givers, but they were lying both to the Holy Spirit and to the church. Got them in big trouble. They lost their lives. Then there's a guy in the New Testament by the name of Demas, D-E-M-A-S, and Demas was a co-worker with Paul, traveled with Paul. But at the end of Paul's life, Paul wrote one of the saddest little sentences about this one-time good friend and co-worker. He said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. It would seem that Demas got caught up in the need for financial gain to the extreme that he forsook Paul. So we have some relationship to money. And sometimes that is only seen when we lose what we once had. Back in 1975, six armed gunmen walked into a bank and held it up. This is in London, England. And they took a little over $7 million worth of money and property, jewelry. One lady had her collection of jewels in a little box in a safety deposit box in the bank. They took that. It was appraised at around $500,000. That's just her jewelry. That's just what she would wear on her neck. Well, when she discovered they had stolen it, she told the press, everything I had was in there. My whole life was in that box. That's a pretty sad thing to say, isn't it? Your whole life was in a box? So, is money the root of all evil? Well, we're going to ask and answer a few questions to get around that. First of all, where does it come from? Where does this notion that money is the root of all evil come from? And you'll be surprised to know, well, it comes from the Bible, sort of. It's In Scripture, kind of, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, is the actual rendering. I draw your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's down there in verse 10. You can read it with me. In my version, the New King James, it says, For the love of money. Stop right there. The love of, those two words change the meaning entirely, and we're going to get back to this text in a little bit, but this is where it comes from. Money is the root of all evil, you can see, is a misquote of this verse that says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. This verse is considered to be one of the most misquoted verses in all of the scripture, and there are several. But in every list that I have found of misquoted Bible verses, number two in the list of misquoted Bible verses is this one. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I'm bringing this up and I'm underlining it for this reason. Anybody can take a text out of context. And when you do that, You're on dangerous ground. You may have heard me say this before. Any text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. 
In other words, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. You can find a proof text for just about anything you want to display. For example, I can take a verse out of context or a phrase out of context and show you there is no God. Did you know the Bible says there is no God? It says that. But now let me give it to you in context. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Changes the meaning entirely. And you can do that with so many different verses of Scripture. So any text without a context can become a pretext for a proof text. You don't want to proof text things. You want to see things in their context, which we're about to do in a few moments. By the way, Satan is a master at misquoting Scripture. Look at the belief system of just about any cult, and you will discover that there is Scripture that is misquoted to form the belief system for that cultic group. We know that Satan misquoted God in the Garden of Eden when he was speaking to Eve. We know that Satan misquoted the Scripture, Psalm 91, when he had a conversation with Jesus Christ on the Mount of Temptation. And uh, Satan said, you know, you should just jump off because the Bible says he will give his angels charge over you to bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. The phrase that he left out of Psalm 91 is, he will keep you in all your ways. Well, this was not one of the ways or the will of God for him to do that. So he took a verse, he took a text, and he took it out of context. Vance Habner used to say, Satan does more harm as an angel of light than he does as a roaring lion. Now, this shouldn't surprise you because Satan has always been a shrewd theologian. He was trained in the best seminary in the universe, heaven itself. So when anybody comes up and gives you a text, demand a context. Go back and look at it in context to get the idea of really what it means. So where does it come from? It comes from the Bible, but it's a misquote of the Bible. Because if this saying were true, if this statement, money is the root of all evil, if that were true, that would mean then that money is the root problem of every single other problem in society. That it is the root of every sin in our hearts. That it is the root of every unruly act in every neighborhood, in every city, of every state, of every country in the world. That's just not so. But there are some people who believe that the greatest evil in any society is money. And they will preach that wealth, all wealth, is wrong. And you go, well, where does that come from? Well, sadly, you could look all the way back to the 4th century. I'm going to give you a little historical context now. 4th century from a Christian cleric named Jerome. Anybody ever heard of St. Jerome or Jerome? Jerome was uh, born in Croatia. He was schooled in Rome. He then went to Syria. Then he went to Bethlehem and lived there, and he died there. He hated wealth, and he was vehemently against wealthy merchants and practically denied that God would ever accept them. He stated, and now I'm quoting Jerome, For all riches proceed from injustice. And unless one has lost, the other cannot find. So this proverb seems to me most true. Either a rich man is unjust, or he has inherited from an unjust man. Either way you look at it, there's sin and evil involved in the accumulation of any kind of wealth. That's St. Jerome. There was another guy in the 4th century. He was a monk by the name of Evagrius Ponticus. Anybody ever hear of that guy? I didn't think so. He came up with this idea of eight evil thoughts. You haven't heard of his name, and you probably haven't heard of the eight evil thoughts, but you have heard of what those eight evil thoughts eventually became known as the seven deadly sins. 
Yeah, one was chucked, and they kept seven. And the seven deadly sins were listed as pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, anger, and sloth. And they said money is involved in most all of them. So they held pretty strongly, some of them, to the idea that money is the root of all evil. And of course, you move a little bit closer to our time, and there have been several movements, anti-capitalism movements, pro-socialism movements, uh, the Occupy movement a few years back. Some of you remember Occupy Wall Street, we're the 99%. It's all against that 1% that has seemingly most all of the wealth. Of course, that comes from, in more modern times, a very prominent figure by the name of Karl Marx, who wrote a book called Das Kapital, which was the critique of political economy. He said capitalism is wholesale evil. There are inherent equality, inequalities in it. It um, uh, foisters the exploitation of workers and the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. Bad, bad, bad. Capitalism is bad. Socialism is good. Didn't do any country who believed in that any good at all. But that's where it comes from. That's the idea of money is the root of all evil. It has several strands throughout history. The second question I want to ask and answer is, what does it mean? What does the text itself mean? So let's go back to the text that we have chosen, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and let's read the text in its context. Verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What do we learn from that paragraph about money in general? Well, we learn a few things. First of all, we learn that money will not make you happy. These verses describe the misery that accompanies the person who um, focuses only on uh, accumulating wealth as an end in itself. Um, you may be familiar with the name John Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, considered to be the wealthiest American in history. Many, many years ago he lived. Uh, he is the founder of Standard Oil, the Standard Oil Company. Uh, he said, I have made millions and they have brought me no happiness. Now, that's such a categorical statement for a rich guy to make. I have so much money, it's brought me no happiness. And I've actually read many such sayings of rich people. There's no joy in it. There's no happiness in it. He didn't give me what I expected. It's like what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes. There's an old Roman proverb that says, money is like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. So go back to verse 6 and look at the key word, contentment. Godliness with contentment. Contentment simply means it's enough. It's enough for me. It, it speaks of inner sufficiency that brings peace. I have enough. I am at peace. And notice what it is tied to, godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So we learn, first of all, that money won't make you happy. The second thing we learn from this little paragraph is that money is only temporary. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You've heard me say many times, you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. Nobody takes what they have with them. Now, the Egyptians thought they could do that when they buried all the gold and pots and silver and statues in the tombs with the pharaohs, but the pharaohs are gone and decayed, and those items still remain. 
Now, when Paul writes this, we brought nothing into the world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. It seems that he is quoting at least two verses from the Old Testament. One is from the book of Job, when Job lost everything. And he said, naked I have come into this world, and naked I shall leave. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The second one is Ecclesiastes 5. As he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. He shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. So death is a lot like birth. You are born naked and penniless. You die naked and penniless. There was a rich man who died. He had a funeral for him, a very, very expensive, elaborate, posh funeral. People were wowed just by what they saw in terms of the flowers and the music and the band that they had. And so uh, somebody leaned over to the undertaker during the funeral and said, well, how much did the, the old guy leave? The undertaker said, he left all of it. You can't take anything with you. You come naked, you leave naked. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. My favorite story is about the man who made his wife promise that when he died, she would take all of his money and bury it with him. So she made the promise. He's on his deathbed. What are you going to do? I want you to take all my money, put it in the casket with me because I'm going to take it with me. They say you can't do it, but I'm going to give it a try. So at his funeral... The casket was about to close. The wife walked up to the casket as the guy was closing it. She said, just a minute, and she placed a little metal box inside the casket. She went and sat down again, and her friend leaned in and said, you weren't dumb enough to put all his money in that casket. She said, well, I did make a promise, so of course I did. I put all of his money in that casket. She said, oh, that's the stupidest thing ever. She says, don't worry, just listen. I went to the bank, I got all of his money out, put it in my account, and I wrote him a check. <laughs> That's what's in the box. If he can cash it, he can spend it. I've always liked that story. Money won't make you happy. Money is only temporary. Third, money ruins simplicity. Money ruins simplicity. Look at the eighth verse. And having, notice this, food and clothing with these we shall be content. Shall we? Really? With food and clothing, with these, we shall be content. I remember, and I was just thinking about it yesterday, when I first gave my life to Christ, it was in San Jose, California, you know the story, I was watching Billy Graham on television, well, I, I knew I wanted to go back down to Southern California to the church I had heard about and been there a few times called Calvary Chapel. All I had to my name was a couple pieces of clothing and my motorcycle, a little Honda 450 motorcycle, which I got on and I rode from San Jose all the way down in one day to Southern California, several hundred miles. I had just given my life to Christ. I was the happiest person I knew on the earth. And I am singing songs of praise. I didn't even know songs of praise. I was making them up. But I was so happy. But then, have you noticed the more things you have, the more complicated life becomes? Remember, Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and he talked about having to manage his money and his possessions, and he worried about them. And he even worried about who he would pass them on to. So there are two ways to be rich. One is to have a lot of possessions. The other is to have few needs. Money ruins simplicity. Fourth and final lesson we learn from this little paragraph is that money can be risky. Money can be risky, and that takes us to verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness 
and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. First thing you notice is money is not the problem. The problem is the love of it. You can have no money and still love money and be guilty. It's the love of money, not money itself. Money isn't the problem. It's the love of money. It kind of is a, is a um, parallel to verse 9, those who desire to be rich. That's the idea. They desire it. They don't have it, but they desire it. The second thing to notice here in that little verse, verse 10, is that money is not the root of evil, but a root. Not a definite article, an indefinite article. And the third little thing to notice in verse 10, it's not the root of all evil, but all kinds of evil. And there are many different kinds of evil. Now go back to verse 10 and look at that phrase, love of money. Three words, love of money. It's one word in Greek. The word is philarguria. Philarguria literally means fondness for silver or silver lover. Fondness of silver. And then look at the word greediness also in verse 10. Aragomenoi means to crave or better translated to extend yourself, to stretch yourself out in order to have. You've ever heard people say, he's overextending himself. She's overextending himself. What it means is this. They're stretching themselves out. They're so in love, fond of the silver, the shiny, the gold, the money, that they will overextend themselves in order to obtain it. And notice the result of that risk. I say money can be risky. Uh, It says... They have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I named a few sorrows that I could think of. Selfishness, quarreling, cheating, fraud, robbery, hatred, perjury, violence, murder, human trafficking, drug pushing, pornography sales, blackmail, exploitation of the weak. All of those are many sorrows. It seems that Paul is most concerned with the chief of the many sorrows, and that is in verse 10, some have strayed from the faith. Remember the parable that our Lord spoke of, that the seed fell on soil, but it was choked up by the cares of this world, the desire for riches, the desire for other things that choked the seed and it became unfruitful. So then, The problem is not with money. The problem is with us. I started this sermon talking about people that were ill-affected by money, like Achan in the Old Testament, or Ananias and Sapphira in the New, or Demas in the New Testament. But it's equally true that there are people in Scripture that God blessed greatly and were very wealthy, and it did not ruin them. It did not ruin them. Abraham is one. Abraham had a paid staff of 318 people. 318 paid servants. It meant his household was way over a thousand people. Job was wealthy. It says he was the wealthiest guy on earth, but he was also the godliest guy on earth at the time, according to God himself in Job chapter 1. Then there is Joseph who was second in command over Egypt, arguably the second richest person in the world, also very godly. So it can ill affect a person, but it doesn't have to. There are plenty of examples of people who handled great wealth with integrity. Something else you should know. The Bible also commends earning money, saving money, and investing money. Here's one little verse, Proverbs 24. Through wisdom, a house is built. By understanding, it is established. By knowledge, its rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. So the notion that socialism is the way to go and capitalism is evil and wrong and and people shouldn't earn wealth and have it as private property, is, is that's just, that's bogus, that's wrong. By the way, the Bible acknowledges the right to own private property, 
And I'll just give you the Eighth Commandment and the Tenth Commandment. Eighth Commandment says, Thou shalt not... What? Anybody know the Eighth Commandment? Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Sorry, I just took you off guard. I know that. Not fair. Eighth Commandment is thou shalt not steal. Tenth Commandment is thou shalt not covet. You shall not covet. Stealing and coveting are wrong because the stuff you are stealing and coveting doesn't belong to you. It belongs to someone else. That's private ownership or capitalism. Now, some of you might argue and say, yeah, but Jesus, didn't Jesus tell the rich young ruler that he should sell everything he has and give it to the poor? Yes, he did say that to the rich young ruler. He did not say that to Mary, Martha, Lazarus, John, Peter, Nicodemus, on and on and on. He said it to that guy because that guy loved money so much, it was the impediment that kept him from following Christ. Money had become a god to him. And so Jesus nailed it in his life. So the, the problem is not with money. The problem is with us. Money doesn't have a mind of its own. Money doesn't have a will of its own. It is at your discretion. So we've asked and answered two questions. Where does it come from? What does it mean? The third and final little question I'd like to ask about this is based on what we have just talked about, how should we live? As believers, how should we live so that the love of money doesn't enter in and become an evil thing in our lives? Well, that's actually a question Peter asked. At the end of his little letter, Peter said, Therefore, since all these things on earth, the created universe, will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What he writes about is everything you see around you is going to melt with fervent heat one day. It's all going to burn. Everything you love and enjoy in the physical world, in the material world, will be burned up. And he says, how should we then live? Well, let me give you a few suggestions. First of all, be free. Be free. Have a light touch with it. Have a light touch. There's two ways to hold something, with a tight fist or with an open hand. Uh, Job, I love what he said. He lost everything, and he said, the Lord gives. The Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My uh, dad had an interesting childhood. I won't get into uh, details, but he, I remember him telling me the story that he had a pet raccoon. And I said, what? You had a what? Who has a pet raccoon? Because raccoons are pretty vicious. And they have some long claws, and they can, be, they, can, they can attack and do damage. But I don't know if they decluttered or whatever, but he had a pet raccoon. And the, here's the old way to catch a raccoon. If you want to catch a raccoon in the old days, you take a little box with bars in it, and you stake it to the ground. You put a piece of tinfoil, like a little tinfoil ball inside. That's all you got to do, a little tinfoil ball inside the cage. The raccoon sees the shiny silver, reaches his hand in, you know, sort of like a monkey with a coconut, puts his hand in, grabs the ball. Um, it, the paw changes shape now, becomes enlarged. He can't pull it out of the cage. If it's on the ground, he, he won't move. Listen, he won't move. He would rather give up his freedom and his life for a piece of silver. So be free. Have a light touch with the things of this world. It's okay to have things. It's okay to have things. The danger is when the things have you. So have a light touch on those things. And as you loosen your grip, remember to raise your hands up, which brings us to the second way to live, and that is be thankful. Be thankful for what God has given you. Be thankful for what he has placed as a steward that you are to manage, whatever it might be, however much it might be. Pause and thank him for it. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, the Bible says. Now, you might not have everything you want, but can you trust him that he's giving you everything you need? That's where you 
should be thankful. An old Chinese proverb says, when you drink from the stream, remember the spring. Remember the source from which that water flows. So often we want the hand out without the hands up. Jesus healed 10 lepers. Remember the story? 10 lepers were healed miraculously. They walked away. How many returned to give thanks? One. One out of 10 gave thanks. And Jesus received his thanks, but he asked the question, where are the other nine? How come they're not thankful? So be free and be thankful. Third, be content. Be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And then verse 8, having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Did you know that a hundred years ago, the average American could list 70, 70, 70 things he or she needed in life to survive? 70 things. Today, the average American lists over 500 things that they say they need. Now, 100 years ago, that's 1924. That's like basic necessity, Bill. Uh, they wanted food, bread, potatoes, beans. Uh, they list clothing, work shirts, overalls, sturdy boots, household goods, coal for heating, kerosene lamps, cooking pots, and soap. Uh, they list farm tools, a plow, a rake, a shovel, basic medical supplies, because they're living out in the country, a lot of them, a very rural lifestyle, so they needed stuff to uh, fix wounds, etc. Seventy things they need, today over 500. Godliness with contentment is great gain. A person who is satisfied that their life is pleasing to God is a rich person, a very content, satisfied individual. Now, one of my favorite verses that I think strikes balance to the acquisition and ownership of wealth is Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9. I don't know if you've ever read this, but let me read it to you. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me, this is a prayer to God, feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Lord, you know what I need far better than I do. I don't want an extreme in either way that I'm so poor that I'd be tempted to steal and give you a black eye, a bad name. I don't want to have so much that I neglect you or deny you. It sounds a whole lot like give us this day our daily bread that Jesus taught us to pray. So be free, be thankful, be content. Number four, be responsible. Be responsible. With whatever you have, be responsible. Pay your bills. Pay your gulp taxes. Give back to God your first fruits. Invest whatever you can for your family. That's being responsible. And then finally, and I'll close with this, be generous. Be generous. Did you know that it was Jesus who said, it is more blessed to give than receive? You've heard that, but you know, you never find that in any, any of the four Gospels. But it is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 20. It's a quote of Jesus left out of the Gospels, included in the book of Acts. But what a gem. It is more blessed to give than receive. Now, we've been reading 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, go ahead in that chapter. Go to verse 17 and look how he sort of brings this toward a close. Command, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Stock market goes up and down. But in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, let them do good 
that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Here's the deal. See money as a tool. Yes, money can be evil. Yes, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, but it is also a tool for all kinds of good. And if you handle it correctly, it becomes a tool for good. I'm going to remind you of a story that if you've ever read it, it's taken you off guard because it's such an odd story. Jesus told a story about a manager who was unjust. Uh, he, uh, he wanted to curry favor with his clients, uh, with his master's clients. He gets fired from his job, but before he leaves his job, he works out this deal that's really an underhanded deal. And the manager or the owner finds out about the manager and actually commends him for using his noodle and being shrewd with what he had. And then Jesus applies that strange story and he says this, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That's the application. In other words, money can be used to open doors to eternity for certain people. And when it's used that way, it cannot be called evil. Imagine you showing up in heaven, whenever that'll be. Might be by the end of the day. Might be in 20 years. But you, you end up in heaven. You're in heaven. It's your first day. You're looking around going, wow, wow, cool, awesome, awesome. And then I, I haven't seen you for a long time. You, you recognize people. And then somebody walks up to you, and then another person walks up to you, and they say, thank you. And you go, I don't even know who you are. And you, they say, well, thank you, because it was your generosity that gave to that missionary that was sent out overseas, and that missionary shared the gospel with me, and I gave my life to Jesus, and my sins were forgiven, and I'm here in part because of you. You have just fulfilled this verse Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Or the Thanksgiving pickup party where there's going to be 10,000 people around the city that never get on this campus, that will be on this campus, and see and hear the love of Jesus Christ who may make decisions. We've seen that happen in the past for Christ. And they will say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are using money as a tool. In 1966, J. Paul Getty was called the wealthiest American, and he said this. This is my favorite saying that he has ever said. He said this, money is like manure. Stack it up, and it stinks. But you spread it around, and it makes things grow. That's seeing money as a tool. That's when money doesn't become a root of all kinds of evil, but a source of all kinds of good. So a lot of it is how we see our world and see ourselves in this world. Final story I close with. A rich man visited a rabbi. Rich man was very rich and very miserable, as a lot are wont to be. And uh, so the rabbi met with him, and the rabbi said, look, come over here. Look out the window. Look out the window. What do you see? He said, I see a few women. I see some children playing. I see grass. He, he named what he saw. The rabbi said, now step back, and he pointed to a mirror. He said, what do you see? He said, well, I see myself. He said, that's interesting, because... The window is made out of glass. The mirror is also made out of glass with a little bit of silver applied. No sooner is the silver applied when you cease seeing others and see only yourself. He was trying to show him the relationship that man had with finances. 
He's looking at life. He's only thinking about himself. He has lost the ability to see through the window and see the needs of others. Father, we pray that you will help us to have the kind of eyes that see the world as Jesus saw them. A compassion for the lost, a compassion for the hungry, a compassion for the weary, a love for all men and women in spiritual matters, not to see the world just politically or just socially or economically, but spiritually. And Father, we pray that whatever you have given us, we would be thankful for, have a loose grip on, and be faithful to the expansion of your kingdom, making eternal friends by the right use of what you have given us to use as temporary stewards. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We'd love to know if this teaching impacted you. Share your story with us by emailing calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church slash give.
talk You'll go farther when you take that walk It's all in the way you make them feel A spark of kindness seals the deal No need to push, no need to shove Connection starts with honest love You make them feel seen, make them feel heard A little kindness goes beyond words You want to win, it's simple and true Be sincere in all you do That's how you win A heart or two Then they remember It's a start It hits them right Straight from the heart Compliments that come from grace Leave a mark, a lasting trace It's all in the way you make them feel A spark of kindness seals the deal No need to push, no need to shove Connection starts with honest love Make them feel seen, make them feel heard Just getting ahead, build bridges with 